party since he's their only member. An accountant he was drawn into politics late has moved from the right, but not, he says, to the centre or the left, but out in front, where he believes the Greens are setting a new agenda. He insists on the freedom to criticise extradition arrangements while also sternly opposing all violence in the North. That's our panel, and our first question comes from Anne Brady. Does the panel think that in view of the imminent electricity cuts that such deliberate curtailment of essential services should be made illegal? Should the law, in other words, intervene and not allow strikers in such an important industry uh, the right to strike? I mean, that's the substance of the question. Shane Ross. No, I don't. Uh, I think it would be an extraordinary uh, infringement of people's democratic rights if you were to actually forbid certain areas to strike, and even spe special uh, vital services. One of, the, one of the worst things, I think, that happened in the UK in the last few years was the strike between the miners um, and the government. And what you had then was, in fact, a political confrontation. You didn't have a confrontation on issues. It became a, a, an issue where, in fact, the miners wanted to take on the government and the government wanted to take on the miners. I don't think that is something which we want to see here. But I think you've got to accept that the ESB workers are responsible people that they realize the responsibility which they carry, just as much as the ambulance men, nurses, and other people in vital areas. But some are, of them have people. forego the right to strike because of their essential services to the community. The army, for instance, another the Gardaí. The army, of course, and the Gardaí are very special case because they're law and order. And if, if, if the army and the Gardaí went <laughs> actually struck, you, you'd have a situation where, where you'd have a mutiny, and you've got a, a, a civil disturbance as a result of that, and crime rampant on the streets. In this situation, I think you've got to give them the right to strike. I think they're responsible people, and I think they've also got to be sensitive to the fact that if the ESB have power cuts tonight and tomorrow, the public opinion will turn against them. So certainly, yes, you've got to treat them responsibly and they'll respond responsibly. Right. John Alderdice. Shane Ross says there'd be mutiny if the Gardaí or the... But wasn't there, in effect, mutiny when the power workers uh, struck against the Sunningdale Agreement in 1974 in Northern Ireland? Well, certainly there was a very dangerous situation developed, but I think that we have a very complex society in which there are many groups of people who perform very vital functions and who, if they withdraw their functions, create major difficulties for the running of a society. I think we all have to accept that. But it's quite a different thing to suggest that people then must have that right to strike withdrawn because the question then is, if people have a major disagreement, how do they express that disagreement? And if well, they can... have to be compensated, presumably. It would be by negotiation that they might... Uh, negotiate the yes, withdrawal of this right. Indeed, but if, if, if you compensate them financially or in some other way, it's not many years before that's forgotten. And then people get into the situation again where they say, well, all we can do is, is speak about the problem. And, and if you don't give people the right to strike, I think there is the danger of them moving towards civil commotion, chaos uh, and violence. Uh, so I, I think that however uh, much it may disadvantage and, uh, and irritate people, uh, the right has got to be there. And, of course, if they disadvantage people too much, as has already been suggested, then they lose, uh, they lose public support. Anne Connolly? Yes, I would agree with the other two that the answer does not lie in removing their right to strike. There was a period during the 70s where there was a succession of very damaging ESB strikes, and we survived it all. What did happen, however, was that management within the ESB was forced to take over managing industrial relations. We've moved to considerable distance now from the old days when the Department of Public Services actually managed industrial relations on behalf of the public service generally. And management within those bodies had to do very little except turn up in the Labour Court. That day has changed. And what's news about today is not that there's going to be a strike, but that it's so long since we've had any industrial rest. And I think the issue now is... Uh, I mean, it's gone through considerable conciliation, obviously, to date, and it's now over to the Labour Relations Commission, and they're going to have a very interesting uh, first bite, as it were, or test case. Right. Roger Garland, what's your view on the merits of the question? If, uh, because the services are essential, because the damage to the economy is uh, so disproportionate uh, to the, the case uh, that the right to strike might be negotiated away? I think there's a very strong case <clears throat> for treating power workers in the same way as the army and the Gardaí. Now, how we arrive at that situation is another matter. Now, clearly, of course, this is not a good time to talk about taking away the right to strike. The trouble about all these things is this strike will be settled maybe in a few days, maybe tomorrow, the day after, and the whole subject will be forgotten about again until it comes up maybe in five or ten years' time. The time to do this is not now, but later, in a reasoned way, to negotiate a deal with 
the power workers. But I think in the long run it is in the public interest to put them in the same category as, as the army and the guardie, because they're a very, very vital uh, source of, of our whole prosperity depends on it. And I think the public would be very, very angry if this strike goes to power cuts. And they're not interested, rightly or wrongly, in, in who's right and who's wrong. They're just going to, they're going, most of them will blame the workers, some may blame the management. And I do think the issue has to be faced up to, and I think, I think it, it should, and I'm sure will be addressed after when this matter is sorted out. But if the strike happens, we're all back, presumably, to some extent, to candles and so on. I thought that's what the Greens stood for, the simple life. <laughs> well, yes, up to a point. But, I mean, electricity is a fact of life, and especially when it's generated as some of our electricity is from, uh, from renewable energy. Right. I'd just like to um, come in there, John, yeah, for one second. I, I think you have a problem here, because <clears throat> if you forbid them to strike, and they decide that they're not going to take any notice of you and they go on strike anyway. What are you going to do? Are you going to send all the power workers to jail one by one? You can send no, no, hundreds of thousands to them. negotiation, presumably. That well, I can't see them agreeing to that. Handsome compensation if they were to withdraw. Anyway, Anne Brady, ask the question. What's your own view? Surprised at the answers. I, I think myself that uh, we're in a situation where the ESB have a monopoly on the supply of electricity, and the public are at their mercy. There's no alternative to them, and I feel that that nobody <coughs> should have that type of power that they can actually cut off mothers in their homes trying to heat milk bottles for children, hospitals, the whole business of the country for an indefinite period because of something that should be arbitrated or dealt with through the the, the labour courts. And I feel that it should be much more difficult for power workers to go on strike. Perhaps not made uh, totally illegal, but they should, it should be much more difficult than for your ordinary firm. Right. Woman in the second row, yes. Agree with that because I think there would be a huge problem if they didn't have any recourse to any sort of action. I mean, I, I feel very sorry for people, and, and I know personally that are out on strike at the moment and they won't get any money that they're on strike. And eventually, when these electricians go back to work, they will end up being compensated and getting their increase. And some of the workers in the ESB, and I know personally, have fallen way, way behind in what they used to be paid. They were always up there, very well paid, but that's not the case anymore. And I think it would be a shame if they didn't have this sort of action that they could yeah. take. Anybody else on this? No. Oh, could could, could yes, I just say, John, yeah. I mean, one interesting development, perhaps over the next few years, would be the re-establishment of the interconnector, the electricity interconnector with Northern Ireland, yeah. which could mean that in such a situation, the, uh, the whole issue becomes even more complex, because you could find that the electricity supply would actually be coming from Northern Ireland, where we've got far more capacity to provide electricity than we actually need. So uh, there's a further complication to the situation, I think. It might also be a potential solution, to some extent. It would ameliorate a strike in either jurisdiction, wouldn't it? It certainly would be fascinating if Northern Ireland could start providing some solutions for the Republic of Ireland, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get on to that. We'll be, we'll, we'll be on to that later. Maria O'Brien has uh, another question. Yes. Yes, John. In view of the fact that the three main uh, market research companies have now published almost identical figures on the necessity for divorce, um, that it's now time for the government to actually formulate the wording of a referendum rather than more discussion documents. Right, both IMS, MRBI and Lansdowne Research have all come up very roughly re in recent times with a two-to-one vote in favour of, uh, of divorce. Um, and as should the government now act? Shane Ross. Well, I would, I've advocated divorce full, full throttle for the last ten years. And uh, indeed, I brought the first motion on that to the Senate, I think, in 1983 and 84. And I completely agree with what the question ha had to say. I think what the government state publicly, their public position is, that they don't want to go into a divorce referendum and lose it, and they don't want to hand out hostages to fortune, uh, like not having settled the question, all the very complicated questions about the division of land, the division of property, and that sort of thing. And what their public position is, is that all that will have to be settled before they go to a referendum. And the signals are coming out from the government, and they are encouraging, but I don't necessarily believe them, but the signals are coming out that when those issues are settled, they will then have a referendum, which they will recommend to the people. I've yet to believe that that's going to happen, and I'm not sure this isn't a delaying device. But the Taoiseach has also said that he, he would await the expression of a strong public opinion in favour. Now, do you think he's now got that? Well, you know, if he's going to keep waiting like that, he could, he could wait forever, because we had public opinion according to the polls in favour many times before, and it's actually reversed. What we need, in fact, is Fianna Fáil to support it. 
What we need is Fianna Fáil to come out and recommend a divorce referendum to the people, and then it will be passed. I think you'll find the other parties actually do support it. But Fianna Fáil, at the last general election, at the last referendum, took a very ambiguous and ambivalent attitude to it. And what we need is them to come out and full throttle and say, we support this and we recommend it. And I think it'll be done. Now, I don't believe they've got the political courage to do that. I think they'll probably fudge it. But that's what we need at the moment. Right. Roger Garland. Well, the Green Party position is that we support the holding of a referendum. Now, if it's felt that there's sufficient public opinion in favour of a change, and it's a 64% looks, well, it could be a bit higher, but it looks convincing enough. Maybe not this year, perhaps next year. But it's, the wording of the referendum is crucial. Now, presumably what is intended is a simple... But you said you're in favour of holding yes, a, referendum. a referendum. Are you in favour of divorce? That's a different matter. Can I finish, sure, yes, finish yes. John, please? Now, it's, it's a question of how the referendum is worded. Now, we would not be happy with a referendum simply to remove the offending clause in the Constitution, because what that does, it takes away power from the people and gives it back to the government. We want to keep the power with the people. What we would like to see is a referendum which, which would say, remove the constitutional ban from the introduction of divorce legislation. If that is passed, then the Oireachtas has the job of preparing the legislation. The legislation will be passed in Dáil Éireann, in some form or another. It will be resubmitted to the people for acceptance or rejection. So thereby the people will have an input into the type of divorce they want. Because people who want divorce, some people want divorce and demand, some people want a very difficult divorce, and, and some people who would be in favor of difficult divorce if it was a question of easy divorce or no divorce, they'd rather have no divorce. So it, it's not just a question of divorce or no divorce, it's much, much more complex than that. Right. John Alderdice, how does that, this issue look to you as leader of the Alliance Party, looking set? Somewhat puzzling um, that uh, s some of these issues like, like, like land and ownership and all of these things uh, should be treated in this matter uh, as though they were completely unknown anywhere else in the world and that nowhere else in the world had found a way of dealing with these very, very complex questions. I mean, it seems to me that it would be rather easy to look at the ways that these things have been dealt with elsewhere. Uh, I mean, it was interesting the way you put it, you know, do you support divorce? Would you, pr would you propose divorce? Obviously not. One proposes that people, if they want to be married, have a happy marriage. But one certainly proposes that if people find themselves in, in, an, in an irretrievable position, that that has got to be available. And, and I have to say I find it puzzling and, and somewhat astonishing that at this stage in the century, it's something that isn't available in, in this part of the world. Anne Connolly? I think what's interesting about the opinion poll this time around, and we, we must face up to this, the opinion poll now is showing a 10% lead against any other opinion poll in favour of divorce. And there are two things that have changed. First of all, I think Fianna Fáil have sent out fairly clear signals that they are now ready to change their position on divorce. Because I would go further than Shane, having campaigned during the last divorce referendum and stood outside polling booths, I have no doubt but that Fianna Fáil campaigned very actively against divorce. And I think that situation will have changed this time round. Uh, however frustrating Fianna Fáil can be as legislators for social change, they do one thing that's interesting, they follow the people so that if they ever bring anything uh, to a referendum we can be fairly sure it's going to be passed. The second thing is that the tactics used by the anti-divorce lobby could only work once. They were uh, they were scare tactics that frightened a lot of people and the opinion polls showed fairly quickly that fairly soon after the referendum people were changing their minds again and there's been a steady increase in favour of divorce since. I think the third issue that will focus Fianna Fáil's attention and our own generally will be the Northern Ireland talks. It's going to be increasingly difficult to sustain a support for the current constitutional prohibition in the light of developing talks in, with Brooklyn in Northern Ireland. Right. Maria O'Brien, you asked the question. Yes, um, I'd just like to get back to the point that I think that if Fianna Fáil, I agree with both Anna and Shane Ross, that if Fianna Fáil put their minds to it and you know, agree to do something about it, it will get through because a lot of Fianna Fáil followers, I regret to say, are like sheep, they follow the leader. If the leader says yes, they do it. And I think that that basically is the problem. The last time out, they definitely, absolutely did campaign against it. Right, anybody else in the audience on this? Man on the third, fourth row, yeah. At the edge, yeah. After making his change of uh, political beliefs at the weekend to join Fine Gael, not have the confidence in Fine Gael to be able to carry through 
um, a campaign again for the referendum on divorce. Absolutely, I have no, no problems about that at all. He's saying that they would support, that Fianna Fáil can take their support for granted, whereas the reverse was not the case. That was his point, I thought. Yeah, but I felt that what Shane had stated there was that he felt that Fianna Fáil were the people that were holding this up. But does he not feel the confidence in the, par the political party in Fianna Gael that they would be able to carry it through? No, he's well, counting seats and votes and, and the opinion polls, and he knows think, that they're not yes, yet a majority. That's what I think he is. Mind yes. you, once he joins, yes. there will be a major change. Isn't this right, well, Shane? Yeah. Shane was the yeah. person at the beginning here who stated that in, back in the 70s, he was the first person to bring legislation into the Senate. Yeah. And yes, still, he's joining Fianna Gael. So really, he should be joining Fianna Fáil to try and get them to change their mind. Yeah. I think it would be difficult, you know. Right, <laughs> OK, probably for both parties, yes. The woman in the third row, yes. Of talker, uh, there was mentioned that the, the issue was being fudged. I was really amazed at Roger Garland's uh, attitude that he would bring a referendum first, then go back and discuss the legislation, and then bring the legislation to the people. Surely, as, as John Alderdice has said, the duty of the legislators is to legislate. There are plenty of instances throughout the world where divorce legislation has been introduced, and this really is totally... I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm baffled by it. There's, there's criticism of Fianna Fáil, who are the largest party. But if, if, if uh, Roger says he's going to lead, that he's not of the right or of the left, but of the lead, he certainly isn't doing that if he, if he says he'll bring a referendum. Then he'll go back to the dog. Well, you you and need then an, an initial referendum since it's... Oh, I agree. Yes, but, but, okay. but certainly not to go back to the people and say, what kind of wording do you want? That sounds very much right. like fudging Do you want to answer that? No, you see, there are two separate issues here. Divorce is one issue, but the other issue is an issue of democracy. The Green Party basically believe in decisions by people, not by politicians. We have very grave reservations about the whole system of representative government. We're working on a policy document at the moment. Basically, we believe in power to the people, preferably at local level, but clearly in a matter like this, it would have to be at national level. And I think people in this country should take more responsibility. They do in Switzerland, for example. They have to take more responsibility for the kind of laws that are passed and not be always passing the buck to, to the government and to the dole. That's really all I'm saying. I, 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 I would have thought everyone would see that as a great advantage, but, but if you don't... Your, your constituency voted perhaps one of the heaviest in the country for divorce. Yeah in the last referendum. So that's John, yeah, you. Okay. Yeah, right. Can I intervene, John? Because I think the question in relation to fudging is coming across. I find it very difficult to get any sort of image as to where the Green Party are in relation to divorce. Okay, you, need, you may need the two steps. Do you personally support a change in both the constitution and the legislation so that divorce can be legislated for? I don't think this is necessarily a matter of party politics, and I don't. Uh, I my personal view on divorce is my own is my own affair. Oh, but as I don't a politician, wish, surely you've got to. Tell I us. don't wish to disclose it. No. As a panelist, you don't wish no. to disclose it. If there was a referendum that went through the door, which way would you vote? I would have to see the wording of the referendum first, and I would discuss it with my party colleagues. I'm a member of a, of a party, and these things are discussed. Uh, with my party colleagues, and a decision is made at the time. But could I, 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 I found that particularly astonishing because what you were saying earlier on was that you wanted people, instead of doing things at a centralist kind of level and, deter and having it determined by the government, mm -hmm. that you wanted it determined by people on a much more individual basis. And we, what it seems well, you're saying is that you'd have to have no, no, the agreement I mean, of your party no, no, colleagues. Sorry, d divorce, it, obviously, obviously you can't introduce, well, presumably you couldn't, well, I suppose you could introduce divorce in Cork and not have it in Dublin, for argument's sake. But I think most people would accept that divorce is something you either have it for the whole country or you don't have it. All I'm saying is that the people should decide, not the politicians. If you're the people, if you think you want us to do it, well, you're entitled to say that. We think it's the wrong way of doing things. We would like to see all laws, if necessary, going and to... Can I ask you this, Roger? Do you disclose your personal view on this to your party colleagues? Well, we do discuss it, yes. Right, OK. We move on. Catherine Delahunt has another uh, topic uh, to ask. Yes. Would the panel agree that the inclusion in the census form last night of a question regar regarding religious belief to be a gross invasion of a person's privacy? The census of last night had a very detailed question on, on religion and Connolly. No, I think it's going to be one of the more interesting answers that we can look forward to getting as a result of the census. Um, the fact that it's done every 10 years is a very useful barometer for us to see and monitor the changes that have taken place. My only regret, in fact, thinking about the way the census has gone about, is that it's only when it's a fait accompli and the form is lying in your house that the whole hoo-ha about the census actually arises and the question of confidentiality. And much more importantly, what should be in it occurs. And there's also 
sorts of issues being raised this morning very usefully relating to how are we going to monitor homelessness, how are we going to monitor the extent of uh, the numbers of disabled people in the country and their views and facilities etc. It would be very useful if our public representatives gave us advance warning a year or so before the questionnaire was decided upon so that there could be more general social debate as to what questions we most would like answers to. Right. John Alderdice, the religious question, sometimes included in Northern Ireland, but of course centrally included way back, wasn't it, in 1911, on which partition itself was based? I find this a very interesting question because, uh, interesting of course too, that uh, despite all the partition and all the differences, the United Kingdom also had its census on exactly the same day. Uh, so perhaps we've got a lot more in common than we'd like to think at times. But in respect of this question on, on religious affiliation, of course, we've had this whole issue in terms of fair employment in Northern Ireland. And many unionists saying, no, you mustn't ask people their religion because that's an invasion of privacy. And many nationalists saying, well, what you're trying to do is cover over the fact that there has been discrimination and employment and so on in the past. So I think although it can be that people find these things difficult and distasteful, on the other hand, if one is going to monitor some of these important issues, and one of the important issues in the Republic, I do believe, is the fact that the non-Catholic uh, proportion of the population has diminished very considerably. And I think there are serious questions as to whether there's been a chill factor in the Republic uh, for dissenters uh, and others. So I think that although it may be distasteful to people, we find in Northern Ireland that if we're going to address the, the needs of minorities, we've got to ask people to address this question and I suspect that in the Republic of Ireland, it probably is helpful to do the same, even though I can very much understand people's uh, difficulties about it. And is it a matter of controversy in Northern Ireland, for instance, in a situation where people, in some cases, can be murdered for their religious uh, affiliation, and where they're writing this down on a census form and handing it out to a stranger at the door, is that a matter of worry and concern in oh, some oh, difficult areas? Uh, absolutely, and I mean, I've, I've had, for example, apart from, from that, you've had the question of people's employment, and I've had people from the security forces on saying, are we going to be taken to court for not putting down that we're in the security forces on a form which has our name and address and may well target us uh, for murder? Of course, these are very difficult questions indeed, um, but uh, some of these things one has got to try to deal with the best one can. Uh, I think probably you're a fortunate in the Republic that those particular issues don't have to be dealt with. Right, Roger Garland. Well, I wonder is the question you're worried about confidentiality because, of course, we all would have slight worries on the issues of confidentiality. Um, other than that, I, I can see no... One could argue it's a, it's a piece of useless information, but I think it probably is useful enough. And, and as John says, it is interesting, I think, to, to graph the decline in the... In the um, and the, now as he describes the non-Catholic population here, perhaps the, uh, well, yes. But there'd also right. be a rise in the don't <laughs> knows and those uh, who answer none. So yes, I, I, I think it's an interesting question. I, I, I'd like to, uh, maybe the questioner will, would tell me why she... Uh, well, we'll ask her that in a moment. What problem she has with it. Right, Shane Ross, what's your view? <clears throat> um, no, I have no difficulty with it at all. I, I, I filled in Church of Ireland last, last, uh, last night and, I, and I, I felt no problem about that whatsoever. There is, as you say, there's that provision that you can answer none in it and that is a let out for people. I think Roger, for once I'd agree with Roger, I think that uh, confidentiality is the problem. People are worried about filling something in and it getting out, which they don't want to do, something to do with their private life getting out. But once they're assured and as long as there's confidence in the census, I think they should probably ask more questions rather than less. And I think, that, I think that's really the, the real problem with the census. Right. Catherine Delahunt, what's your view? Yes, I think uh, the point about the diminishing numbers of non-Catholics that we've seen the uh, reports on recently, and also the amazing report that said the uh, rise in young people attending the Catholic Church, which was released a couple of weeks ago, which I must say personally I found quite amazing, and I would be interested to see if that comes through on the census. So in fact, I actually think it's a very important question. And why say, did you ask the question here? I mean, is, is it a matter of controversy or debate? I, I think uh, and quite a few people, as uh, Sam Connolly has said, have been talking about it today, much more so than last week or the week before. And it has been a general topic of conversation, and it was areas, the religious question, I think the marriage question, were the two that were featuring quite, quite a lot in conversation. Yes, right, woman here in the front row, yes. I'd like to revert back to um, the question, both north and south, on religion. Um, I was in Northern Ireland at the weekend and I was speaking to a few people about the questions that were asked on, on both census forms. And people were saying, yeah, well, when I looked at that question about religion, I didn't really know what it meant. So I filled in 
member of the Roman Catholic Church, because I was born into that. I no longer practice. So I don't think either North and South, having spoken to people in the South as well, it is going to actually reflect a true picture of religious practice. Right. I mean, the social scientists will ask, were you at church last Sunday? That's the way they measure it, and it's yeah. presumably that's a more accurate thing. But that would, would be an invasion of privacy if people had to answer that question. So we're left with an imprecise uh, volume of information to, to that extent in the census. Um, however, let's move on. M Martina Mulvihill has another question. Yes. In view of the recent statements about the forthcoming Brook Talks, does the panel have any optimism about their future? Right, the Brook Talks. Given the statements uh, Jerry Collins said on BBC Radio yesterday that Articles 2 and 3 would be debated, it might hurt people in Fianna Fáil, but they would be on the agenda, the Unionists seem to have dug in and said that they must go, uh, the South must be a foreign country, and different parties, John Alderdice, have set up uh, different pre-talks, uh, bottom lines, as it were. What's your view? Are you optimistic? I'm cautious. I've been cautious all along, but by no means to the point of pessimism. And, and whilst you say that a number of people have publicly set up uh, sort of bottom lines and so on, I've been interested at how reticent uh, most of the other politicians have been, as I suppose to some extent I have been myself, to make uh, many major statements just before the talks. I do get a sense that uh, most of the political leaders in Northern Ireland appreciate that a, a really heavy burden of responsibility lies on their shoulders. This may well be the last opportunity for some politicians to be part of a, a historic agreement. I think they realise that. There is a real war weariness uh, amongst people in Northern Ireland. They desperately want uh, to see some way forward. Um, so I'm, I'm cautious, I'm realistic, uh, but I'm not pessimistic. Uh, we all come with certain suspicions, but we also come with a, a quite a considerable measure of trust in the chairman. And that and some of the other broader issues may give us a real chance over the next three months of, of something important. And if the politicians don't reach agreement, of course, Peter Brooks says that he will reserve the right to put in his own suggestions. Now, we don't know what they might be. They mightn't be welcome news for the unionists, presumably. Well, they mightn't be welcome news for a number of people. Uh, but I've taken this view for quite a long time. And in fact, uh, up a couple of years ago, I was indicating that he should first discuss with everybody. And if he couldn't find total agreement, then to put down what seemed a very reasonable option and ask people for their <coughs> acceptance of it. Because in Northern Ireland politics, you only agree with what is your ideal, but you very often accept the best terms on offer. And when he did that during March, when his, his, his whole process had been sort of faltering a little bit, in fact, he achieved some success. So I'm encouraged by that, and I've indicated again at the weekend that he shouldn't forget that lesson. It may have to be used again. It's about acquiescing with, what, with your second option rather than getting your first, because obviously everybody's first option isn't available. Well, I remember, I remember it's very interesting, I remember putting this to a senior unionist some time ago. I said, if something reasonable was put down, you wouldn't support it, but you would accept it. He said, no, we wouldn't. I said, yes, you would. He said, no, we wouldn't. I said, well, what would you do? He said, we'd acquiesce in it. So I think that you're quite right. I think you've hit it on the button. And I, I hope we've got a strong as well as sensitive chairman. I think, I think we shouldn't be pessimistic. Right, Anne Connolly. Okay. I think uh, there is a need at this stage to stand back from the whole process because we've been so close to the developments and the one step forward, two steps back, that you do need to stand back and realise the enormity, I suppose, of the historical opportunity that is before us. And I think one has to start by uh, commending Peter Brook on his diplomatic, his considerable diplomatic skills. I think you have to go from there, though. There are three points, certainly, that strike me. Um, this is the first time, really, in the history of our state that there has been this opportunity to bring everybody around this, the one table to discuss possible long-term structures that could bring about possible long-term peace and cooperation between both parts of this island. I think the three points I would want to make on it are, firstly, that it's in all our interests, our social and our economic interests, in both parts of this island, that peace and cooperation is brought about. I mean, the security bill for 1988 uh, amounted to £396 million for both governments. There's enormous economic and social impetus for these talks to work. Um, the second thing, however, I would like to say is that for the first time it 
puts the focus on us in the south as well. Up to now it's been easy for us to say that really change is required, but the change is required of the unionist population. It's up to them now to start making concessions and to stop the veto. But in fact, if these talks are going to be successful and effective, it's going to put the focus back on us. We quite likely talk about abandoning territorial claims, about deleting articles two and three. I think most of us are genuinely ambivalent. We want to see peace, but we have some long-term aspiration to some form of unification, however that might take. Are we really prepared now to see Articles 2 and 3 either deleted or significantly amended? And we've got to start asking ourselves that very, very carefully. And that puts the focus usefully back on ourselves. The third thing I would like to say, and it's, one always has to be very careful in saying it, and one always unfortunately has to start by putting your hand on your heart and say, I do not and never have supported the politics of Sinn Féin or the IRA. That having been said, however, I do think we need a sense of distance from the problem. We get surprised when Bishop Tutus of the world arrive in Ireland and talk about including the men of violence at the table and at the political talks. And too many of us are directly or indirectly involved in the pain and suffering brought about by the violence of the IRA, by the, the murders they've caused. But I think we have to step back from all of that and accept, unfortunately, that at a later stage, if there is going to be long-term peace, long-term prosperity and cooperation, that somehow Sinn Féin will have to be got to that negotiation table. The unfortunate fact of life, and I don't like it any more than a lot of people here are, is that they have some sort of a mandate in Northern Ireland. They command 11, 12, 13, up to 15% of the electorate uh, support in Northern Ireland, depending on the issue. In fact, in some cases, unfortunately, they support more, they command more support than the Alliance Party. Um, this is unfortunate, but it's a fact of life, again, we have to face up to. And because of censorship in the South, and particularly because of Section 31, we, I think we've comfortably skirted issues relating to how they've got to be got but to the table. Would a permanent ceasefire be a precondition in your book for them getting to the table? <laughs> ideally, but I think I would, ideally, I would say that. But I, I, I but think... without a ceasefire, they'd be bombing their way to the table, wouldn't they? There'd be nobody else at the table. Well, I think you have to distinguish here, and it is interesting, Gerry Adams has be, been making this distinction more and more forcibly recently. One has to be able to distinguish between Sinn Féin and the actual armed movement itself. But and I, I, whether you like it or not, and I don't like no, it, I, I, I think, don't think, I think you will get long-term no, peace I think we unless be you're at that guys, table. Yeah. When, when Bishop Tutu was speaking, he was speaking out of a context where, first of all, there is not democracy, and the vast majority of the people are not able to be represented through democratic politics, and therefore there has been a turning to violence. That's a completely different situation from a position where people refuse to accept democracy and, right. turn, to, and turn to the gun yeah. in that situation. Shane, I think Shane it's an important Ross, yeah. difference. Shane Ross. I think it's a great pity that Bishop Tutu decided to make the statement that he did, especially from the pulpit. I think it's very important that we should say that. he, he um, I don't think he's very well versed in Irish affairs. But well, he said that too, that he I, wasn't. Yes, and I think, I think it's, it's a pity that he decided to shoot his mouth off, mouth off about a very sensitive situation about which he doesn't know very much. And I think that should be said. And I think it's a pity that he actually chose a, a church and a sermon to take that opportunity. I don't think it's appropriate he should have said it, and I don't think the place he said it was yeah, appropriate. The question is, are you optimistic about the Brook Initiative now? I think that the miracle is that it's taking place at all. I think it, we have to be very, very thankful to Brooke for the most extraordinary and human patience uh, for actually getting these people, to, to getting the two sides together in, in, the, in the face of uh, appalling difficulties. Could I just say that I, I don't agree with Anne Connolly about Sinn Féin. I don't think they should be allowed to the talks unless they have declared a complete and utter permanent abhorrence of violence. I think it would be an appalling concession to make to the IRA or Sinn Féin, and I make no distinction between them, uh, to actually allow them at that table until they say that they are committed solely to political means. On Articles 2 and 3, I was encouraged, uh, and, I, and I, I, I don't say this lightly, I was encouraged by what Jerry Collins said at the weekend. I, th I think it is difficult for him, to, within his party, to even mention the possibility of negotiating Articles 2 and 3. And I think that the fact that he's done that is an, is an encouraging sign. Right. Now, I think he said there would be difficulties, and I think we've got to acknowledge from, from all sides that there'd be holy war inside Fianna Fáil if Articles 2 and 3 were actually, actually abolished. That would be the last to, to boo. They've had to put up with a, an awful lot of U-turns. So I think Jerry Collins' attitude certainly was an encouraging sign that we get. And I hope that there is the same sort of genuineness from all sides. Right. Roger Garland. Like Shane, I must say I was very disappointed with 
Bishop Tutu. He's a person I have great admiration for. I think uh, the, the man wasn't too well, I believe. He, he had been suffering from the flu. And we all do things when we're tired. And as Shane says, he did it, I think, without any real consideration. He can't have any very detailed knowledge of this country. And I must say, I, I disagree with Anne on the question of bringing Sinn Féin to the conference table. Sinn Féin do not represent the nationalist community in Ireland. The nationalist community in Ireland is represented by the SDLP. And so long, as, and they are the only legitimate, peaceful nationalist party in Northern Ireland. Until such time as Sinn Féin lay down their arms permanently, then they can be asked to the conference table. But certainly under no circumstances should they, should they be asked to it at the moment. Now, uh, to turn to the, the book initiatives, we do, the Green Party does, of course, welcome the initiative. Uh, like John Alderdice, uh, we in the South, I can assure him, are war-weary as well. We haven't had to suffer anything like as much as Northern Ireland, but we've had our problems here. There were 33 people killed in Dublin 20 years ago. So we've had our problems. We've had our tourist trade decimated, our exports to Britain discriminated against from time to time, and it's hard to blame the British sometimes for, for these things. So we've a lot, there's a, we have a lot to gain from a settlement of, of, of this matter. And I feel we're getting much, much closer down here to accepting, uh, I, I think very few people down here now accept the concept that we have to own Northern Ireland. It belongs to us as of right. I think those days are gone. And I feel that if John Hume got up in the morning and said, look, we're merging with the Alliance Party, we've no further interest in a united <laughs> Ireland, we'd say good luck to you, John, and that we'd close the book. I wouldn't I say good luck. I, 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 <laughs> feel that's, I feel that's the stage of thinking down here, even among Fianna Fáil. Right. We're Mark. sick and tired. We want a solution providing its base on peace and justice and a proper Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. Right. Martina Mulvihill, you asked the question. I believe uh, Peter Brook has worked long and hard to bring these talks about. I think he should succeed. Right. Yeah. Man in the fourth row, yes, sir. In the aisle, yep. Yeah. Uh, first and foremost, I think yeah, that, that I would be very optimistic about the Brook talks and the Brook initiative. And I believe that the, that the movement for, forward for that has not just come from Peter Brook, but also come from the Irish government here. And there's just two points I'd very quickly like to make. Number one, I think it's, I'm sorry to see that uh, Shane Ross's new party and his new party leader, Jean Bruton, has seen to carp about it and seen to score political points over the past few days. But secondly, I think the more important point is that uh, while I can understand on principle not wanting to see Sinn Féin at the table at the moment, I think maybe somewhere down the road, hopefully the Brook Talks will obviate the need for Sinn Féin, that the support for Sinn Féin will disappear and will go to the SDLP and go to uh, the, the, the constitutional nationalists in the North. But if it doesn't, some point down the road we have to recognise that it's not so much dealing with Sinn Féin, it's dealing with the people they represent. You cannot exclude a certain section of the community to say, right, we will not talk to you under any circumstances. If you do that, there is only a recipe for disaster further down the road. And I respect the principle of which Shane Ross and John Alderdice and Lee Roger Gardens would say on that, but you have to deal with the political realities, and the political reality says that we must bring all the people together. It's not reintegrating the soil, it's not reintegrating the territory, it's reintegrating the people of the country, and that's the most important point. Yeah. Man in the same row over on the right, yes. Uh, Roger Garland said that um, the SDLP should uh, move in with the Alliance Party and and, no, I didn't say that. Sorry, yeah. Um, I said if they did. And, and, uh, I'm so not recommending they do. I don't dictate to the SDLP. Well, That's I just, their have a they do. I, just uh, I don't think to say that you would love to see a, a united Ireland, which I would, would mean that you condone violence. I hate violence, but I would, for the rest of my life, want to see the people of Ireland united. And I think that's um, a wish of, of thousands of people both south and north of the border. And I wouldn't like that to be taken away. I wouldn't yeah. like the message to come across that we've, uh, we've given up on the yeah. north. Man behind you, yeah. Well, listen to Roger Garland say that <coughs> Sinn Féin does not represent the nationalist people in the north. We're well aware of that. But Sinn Féin represents a vast majority of the nationalist people in Northern Ireland. And are we going to tell no, the people no, in West no, Belfast no, 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 that no. they are not going to be represented at the talks? And also, we hear that the IRA have been asked to lay down their arms. Well, the British troops patrol around the streets of West Belfast and patrol around the border areas watching the loyalist terror gangs go in and shoot people dead in pubs and shooting taxi right. drivers dead. Okay, we have your point, but the, 
The um, Sinn Féin represent West Belfast and the SDLP have three seats, so it's 3-1 approximately. Let's move on. David Sheehy has another question, yes. If I were to mention in honour of Mr. or Mr. Mr. Clerk, would the panel go? If so, why? If not, why not? If invited to lunch in honour of the South African President uh, or his wife, Mr. or Mrs. de Klerk, who are coming, of course, to Dublin on Thursday, would the panel go? If so, why? And if not, why not? Roger Garland. I would not go to uh, any such function with Mr. de Klerk because while Mr. de Klerk and his party in South Africa have moved some way towards and it's very encouraging they've done so towards dismantling apartheid. The fact of the matter is that apartheid is still in place. And uh, this obviously leads on to the question of sanctions, uh, because it's all, it's all tied up in that. Uh, I'm very disappointed with the way the EC and Ireland are beginning to back off sanctions. I think the fact of the matter is that we must be guided by majority black opinion in South Africa, which appears to be represented by the ANC. The trouble about it is, of course, we can't be 100% sure because there is no democracy in South Africa. There is no one person, one vote. But it seems to me that the ANC do represent the majority of black South Africa, and they wish these sanctions to continue. And Bishop Tutu, to quote him again, now has doubts about that. Yes, I mean, it, I'm sure the ANC may not be totally agreed on it. I, I, I mean, the ANC would be the first to admit there has been progress. That's why they're willing to talk uh, to de Klerk. But I, I think it's ridiculous for a small country like this, 12,000 miles away, to be telling the ANC what their tactics should be. This is a tactical situation, and the ANC have the right to, to use whatever tactics they think are appropriate but you would have the achieve... right to go to the lunch or not, so it would be your decision if invited, but you say you wouldn't. Well, I, I have close affinities with the ANC through the Irish anti-apartheid movement, which I've been a member of and a patron of for many years, and I support totally uh, the stance they're taking on this. Right, Shane Ross, you went to South Africa last summer on a fact-finding visit. What is your view? Well, I tried to get uh, President de Klerk to lunch, and he was too busy to meet us, so I'd be delighted to go to, <laughs> I'd be delighted to, go to lunch with him uh, this time. Um, I think we have to be very careful about South Africa, and I think one of the things we have to be very careful about is the ANC and about sanctions. Uh, when I went to South Africa last year with John, Professor John A. Murphy, who was a fellow independent senator at the time, we met the ANC, and they were wonderful people, and they had very, very definite views on a lot of things, but we wouldn't be convinced, first of all, that they spoke for majority black opinion, and secondly, I'm not sure that we should actually necessarily take our diktats from the ANC. We were very privileged. We met Chief Butelezi, who's obviously the head of the Zulu tribe, which is by far the biggest tribe. Uh, and that, his particular movement, the Inkatha movement, wants sanctions lifted and was always against sanctions. Now, I don't know what majority black opinion is, and I don't think anybody knows what a majority black opinion is, and I think we've got to recognize that. But what we've got to say about de Klerk is this. Do we, A, believe him, and do we also approve of what he's doing? Now, one of the things that struck me about the ANC was that they never questioned de Klerk's bona fides. They absolutely were convinced that this was irreversible, what he was doing. And I think it would be utterly wrong if we didn't, in a very tang tangible way, recognize the absolutely dramatic reversal of racism that's happening in South Africa. It's a quite extraordinary revolution that's going on there. Well, it may be super Pader Asmal, who's the chairman of the Irish anti-apartheid movement, said in a letter to the Irish Times today mm. from South Africa, where he's been, mm that the edifice of race, rule, and privilege remains. That little has changed, and he ends his letter, do you still want to give a thousand welcomes? Well, you see, Kader Asmal actually opposed dramatically our, our visit there. He said we shouldn't go, and it was absolutely wrong that we should go. We hadn't got the permission of himself, is what he meant, in fact. Uh, we didn't ask his permission, and we, didn't, and we, and we wouldn't ask his permission. But uh, when we went and met the ANC, they welcomed us. And there is a, there is a, there is a, a discrepancy between that. And what I, the other thing I should say about Kader Singh, as you're quoting him, is this, that when, when he was attacking me on a radio program about, that, about going there uh, for half an hour, uh, after the radio program, I said to him, uh, where are you going? Why, can't we, why, can't, why do we have to record this? Oh, he said, I'm off to Cape Town tomorrow. So he was going himself. That's right. But he's an international legal advisor to the ANC. Yes, but so why should you were we, being used. Why should, that's what his argument why, was. Why shouldn't we go out there and find out what's happening out there find out what the ANC is like. One of the great bonuses we find out was that the ANC were absolutely wonderful people. 
They are very noble, very wonderful people. There's no doubt about that. Right. But not going there would be a very big mistake, and not meeting de Klerk would be an even greater mistake. Right. Anne Connolly. Yes, my, my one and only time to appear on this program before, the first question to land us with was, would we support Shane Ross's visit to South Africa? <laughs> my views really haven't changed since then. I would have to say, the, straightforwardly, no, I wouldn't go to the dinner. I, it's a matter of some regret, personally, and I think to a lot of people in this country, that Ireland uh, had a tremendous record, which we all, or most of us, were very proud of particularly during our presidency, of in supporting the continued imposition of sanctions and comprehensive sanctions. Um, it's a matter of some regret now that ourselves and Denmark have invited de Klerk to this country. I think it's going to be used in South Africa as proof that opposition to sanctions uh, is actually crumbling. That having been said, uh, the, the reality of life is that whether we like it or not, that progress is sanctions now are going to be progressively dismantled. Right. And the issue... I want to stop you there. John Alderdice, would you go to the lunch? Yes, I would. And uh, I think that some of the, the discussions here are quite interesting and, and, and in a way a bit astonishing because when there were all sorts of things being done in Northern Ireland which were discriminating against Catholics and nationalists, I think if there'd been a suggestion uh, that some similar kind of exchange had taken place with the leaders of unionism at that time, there would have been a considerable welcome for it and a feeling that the very fact that a unionist uh, prime minister, for example, was doing such a thing was already a demonstration of the fact that changes were be beginning to take place. I take the view that the fact that the clerk is coming out of the lager in that kind of sense um, and has made very definite, I think, demonstrable proofs of his wish to move things forward is something that ought to be encouraged. I don't think for, for a minute that one should assume that by doing such a thing we're giving him carte blanche or we're saying that we totally mm. approve everything. But the fact that there is some movement, and I agree, irretrievable movement, uh, it may not be as quick as we want, it isn't. It may not be as far as we want, it isn't. But there's some movement, and I think it's only right to give some recognition of that. Right, David Sheehy, what's your own view? I think that uh, Mr. Clerk has shown courage in beginning the process of dismantling apartheid. I think that as both he and Nelson Mandela, whom we, we welcomed last year, uh, presently hold the key to a peaceful future for South Africa, that both he and Mrs. De Clerk should be welcomed and, if necessary, lunched with. Right. Man on the third row behind you, yes. Yes, I'd just like to say that I'm absolutely astonished to hear Shane Ross's remarks, the patronising comments, in fact, about the ANC, I happened to visit South Africa at about the same time last year as Mr. Ross and quite frankly was astonished to see the conditions of some of the townships outside Cape Town and also the level of support that the ANC undoubtedly has in those townships and that's something that Shane Ross has obviously missed in his trip to that country but more importantly if I could just make this one point that the recent white paper on land reform published by the South African government states clearly the opposition of the government to any form of redistribution of agricultural land in that country. And I think that shows very clearly uh, that the bona fides of the government have to be questioned at the very least. Right. OK, we're going to stop that there. We just have two minutes left, and we have a final question from Michael Connor. Uh, I'd like the panellists to suggest how should or how could the City of Culture Year appropriately mark the passing of Sean O'Fallon? Right, the passing of Sean O'Fallon. Anne Connolly. God, I was hoping you wouldn't get to this question and we do the other one first. I find it very difficult to answer that. Uh, I think, uh, I find it very, very difficult given all that he's gone through, Banny. I, I, honestly, I don't know. How about that, John? Right, you okay. You recommended that earlier. I recommended that earlier. Very important three words, I don't know. Shane Ross. I think it's very early because he's just died to, to make suggestions of that sort. I suppose a library. Um, and I suppose maybe the most appropriate place to put it would be in the new department of the Taoiseach in those wonderful buildings which, which Dublin has actually renewed. Could we all get in so, and use so it? So that we could all get in and see that department. See but a library which, which is for use. The books are not there for display. <laughs> well, have to be I, in there. I think we should all have to get in there and see it and use it. It would serve a dual purpose. We'd get into the department of the Taoiseach and see those wonderful new buildings as well. And also it would honour Shona Fallon. Right. John Alderdice? I personally think it would be quite impertinent of me to make any suggestions of what the people of, of this city ought to do on a matter of that kind. Uh, and, uh, but I, I, I do welcome the fact that you are being honoured with the title of City of Culture and, and I wish you well in your year and, and I hope many of you will come to Belfast in 1991 which is also celebrating that year. Right, Roger Garland. 
Well, I'd have to think about that one. Like, like Anne, I was hoping it wasn't going to come up because, um, you know, he was a very great man of letters and I, I, I have read many of his short stories and they're, they're extremely interesting. Uh, perhaps Shane Ross's idea, something, something of that right. nature. Michael Conaghan, you asked the question. What's yeah, your own have, view? I do have some ideas, John. Uh, uh, Sean O'Fallon was a great man of letters, but also he was a man of action. He was an egalitarian. He was a radical. He was a socialist, perhaps. He also built a bridge between letters and politics. And I think it might be appropriately marked in this year of culture by recognising those artistic groups at the grassroots where the year of culture seems to be overlooking. You see, it seems to be the year of cultures for the, those with the access card only. The arts groups in the communities need to be affirmed, they need to be acclaimed, they need to be supported, and I think this would be a fitting right. commemoration to okay. a great man of letters and man of action. Right, we're out of time there. Michael Conaghan, thank you for that contribution. Our thanks also to Shane Ross, to Anne Connolly, to John Alderdice, and to Roger Garland. Of course, uh, no doubt Cork will be honouring Sean O'Fallon too because he wasn't a Dubliner, he was from Cork. That's where we'll be, uh, coming from there next week and from London the week after and then a run right through the middle of June uh, here in Dublin. Thank you for watching tonight and good night. <laughs>